Good evening. I'm Harry Reisner. Not quite two months ago, as we reported, the President's Advisory Commission on Civil Disorder warned that race hatred threatened to tear this country apart. Events this month have made the warning more imperative than before. In more than 100 cities, violence broke out. 40 persons died. The soft spring has not yet given way to the hard summer, but the events have reinforced the words of the Riot Commission. Chairman Otto Kerner reads from the report. This is our basic conclusion. Our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Reaction to last summer's disorders has quickened the movement and deepened the division. Discrimination and segregation have long permeated much of American life. They now threaten the future of every American. To pursue our present course will involve the continuing polarization of the American community and ultimately the destruction of basic democratic values. The alternative will require a commitment to national action, compassionate, massive, and sustained, backed by the resources of the most powerful and richest nation on the earth. From every American, it will require new attitudes, new understanding, and above all, new will. This is a CBS News special. What happened to the riot report? Over four million women look shapelier this year. You can too. How? Just cross your heart. See? You're suddenly shapelier. That's what this new Playtex cotton bra will do. It will cross your heart with stretch to lift and separate. You're suddenly shapelier. Over four million women wear this new cotton bra by Playtex. Cross your heart. You'll be suddenly shapelier too. Announcing a comfortable way to look five pounds thinner. The new five pounds thinner girdle by Playtex. Prove it yourself. Fingertips sew. Press in. See? The new Playtex girdle has fingertip panels to hold you in firmly. Yet it's so different. Feels like nothing you've ever felt before. Look five pounds thinner without losing a pound. New five pounds thinner girdle by Playtex. Now on sale. Save two dollars. This broadcast is an interim look at what happened to the riot report. A final verdict on its effect will take a long time, if we are given the time. The Riot Commission outlined an action program to transform life in our urban ghettos. Six million new homes in five years, two million new jobs, a guarantee of minimum income, far greater aid to schools than proposed thus far. A national commitment backed by the President, the Congress, the people, with money. Since the riot report was issued, a civil rights bill has been passed into law which will make illegal discrimination in sales and rentals of 80% of the nation's housing. A landmark law by past standards. But by present standards, after the murder of Martin Luther King, after new riots, it has seemed to the people in the ghettos too modest an effort, coming too slow. Still, even in the most troubled of cities, with the most complicated of problems, last summer's riots and this year's riots report have caused some change, some change, while most remains the same. A report now from Newark, where last year 23 were killed, a city which broke into flames again this month. Mike Pappas reports. The way you look at the Commission's report on civil disorders depends on where you sit. If you sit here in the central ward of Newark in the Negro ghetto, you feel that the report told you nothing new about the way you live and about the way you treat it. To you, it's just a mass of words. But if you sit at City Hall, you're glad that the Commission itemized all of the illnesses of the ghetto and isolated many of the causes of the diseases. And now you hope that somehow someone will come up with the money to pay for the cure. And these are the scars the illness leaves. This is part of Springfield Avenue, Newark. On the night of July 13th, 1967, hundreds of rioters smashed windows and looted these stores. Losses in the city were put at $10,251,000 by the riot commission. The rioting cost the lives of 23 persons, according to the commission. Hundreds of others were injured. Then, early this month, new disturbances coincided with the funeral of Martin Luther King. There was widespread arson. 
Nearly 600 people were made homeless. There was some looting, but at least this time no one was killed. Then again, this past weekend, a massive fire broke out in the Negro Central Ward. The cost? 500 more homeless. Again, arson was given as the official reason. And now there are new scars over the old. And though there was much praise of how the police reacted in the new ghetto emergencies, the disturbances showed again that Newark's inner core was sick, and the causes of the disease proved familiar. Poor housing, poor schools, and few jobs. The Riot Commission notes, although Newark's population of 400,000 ranks 30th in size among American cities, for the past 20 years, the white middle class has been moving away from the inner core, leaving it to decay. 70,000 whites left. The population shifted from 72% white to 62% Negro and Latin, most of whom rented their slum homes and paid little tax revenue to the city. To continue the tragic cycle of the ghetto, there were few jobs for the uneducated, the unskilled. Responding to the report's findings or to the malaise of the city, some 300 business firms joined with Newark City officials to seek an answer to the question, what does a company have to do to organize, hire, and train the jobless ghetto dwellers? The meeting took place a month after the report was issued, one week before the first April disturbance. Some businesses, like Western Electric, had already found their own answers with programs for the hardcore unemployed. For men like Charlie Dalib, 30-year-old father of two, a participant in last summer's riots. Charlie Dalib, a man who never before has held a steady job, is learning now to wire telephones. But he does not credit the President's Commission with getting him his job. The riot commission report hasn't changed anything. It's the riot that did the changing. You know, that's what changed, not the report. Uh, see, you know, because the people, man, like I say, you just can't, you can't live on promises. You know, if I go to you and say, well, look, man, uh, I'm hungry, man, you know, I need this, I need that. And you tell me, say, okay, uh, I can dig your situation, I, I, I sympathize with you, but, you know, just let it be cool, you know. And uh, this, this goes on for a while, but, man, <laughs> you know, this ain't where it's at. I got to, pretty soon, I got to take some action and let you know that I'm not driving, you know, that I'm hungry. Newark, in its way, is trying to implement the recommendations of the Riot Commission report. In housing, the report recommends that six million low and moderate income housing units be built in the United States over the next five years. Newark City Administration points to the fact that 3,500 new apartments have either been completed or have been put under construction since last summer's riots. Newark's total urban renewal program is the fifth largest in the nation. In the field of education, Newark says that since its public schools are 80 to 85 percent Negro and Latin anyway, de facto segregation is not an issue. But the city admits that its schools are in trouble and has appealed to the state to take over the school system. In an attempt to follow the report's recommendation on police in the community, Newark has allocated funds to storefront police offices. Captain Edward Williams has been assigned to head up the tough 4th Precinct, and Newark police were noticeably restrained during the April outbreaks. There was little firing of weapons and no deaths attributed to police action. I'm, I'm, I'm the new police captain up in the 4th Precinct. Um, you know, I'm trying to do a job here with the people. I need young people to help me out. But Newark has failed to provide more police in the ghetto. And the reason? The city says it can't find men willing to take the work for the pay involved. The success or failure of the report always comes back to money. Mayor Hugh Adonisio. All I can tell you is that we have severe problems in the city of Newark. In my judgment, many of them have to be met with a financial commitment I haven't seen that financial commitment forthcoming from the federal government or state government, and I have to tell you very frankly and honestly that the city is in no position to undertake it by itself. We are willing to do our part. We have the highest tax rate in the, uh, of any city our size in the country, and I just don't know where we can find any additional funds to try to meet these very severe problems. I have practically sent this city bankrupt 
but the city tries. Mayor Adonisio, who along with his police chief, Dominic Spina, were scathingly criticized by black militants after the summer riots, were lauded by white and black militants alike for their work in cooling the anguish of the ghetto after Reverend King's murder. The city has supported what the riot report calls most important, a dialogue. Militants such as Leroy Jones, concerned members of both communities, religious leaders, and representatives of the white power structure attend. Complaints that could become incendiary are aired. This is a meeting sponsored by Newark's anti-poverty agency, the United Community Corporation. There is a sign that attitudes might be changing, that efforts to find jobs, to understand, can make a man like Charlie Dalib think twice before joining a riot. Mr. Dalib, what did you do this time? I didn't do anything this time. I didn't do anything at all. Why not? Well... What was the difference? Well, this time I had a job. You know, last time I didn't. Means of support. For Charlie Dalib, it meant the difference between rioting and not rioting. But there is many another angry man in Newark's ghetto who has not yet broken away from the cycle of poverty and humiliation. He remains an embittered and frustrated individual, but no more frustrated and certainly no more anxious than the mayor himself. There hasn't been any real change made uh, since the riots in my community. I haven't seen any money pouring in here trying to meet these problems. Uh, we're in no position to undertake programs uh, financial programs, that is. Uh, you need money to build housing. Uh, you need money to, to hire people and put them to work. And unless you get that kind of money, it just can't be done. Uh, I just don't think that Congress uh, recognizes uh, uh, or it has not been brought home to them severely enough as to what the real problem is. Well, that was the reason for the Riot Commission report. Well, evidently it hasn't made any impact. The lack of impact hurts in Newark it hurts in big city ghettos across the nation. But it also frustrates the men who were called by the president to write the report. The chairman and the vice chairman of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders both have complained about the failure of federal government to implement what they signed. As the vice chairman of that commission, which spent seven long months analyzing last summer's riots and drawing up solid proposals to stop them at the source, I'm severely disappointed by the failure of the federal government to implement the commission's bipartisan recommendations. We are not moving fast enough or far enough. We are not convincing the people in the slums that our government truly wants to help them. We have not adopted an affirmative national policy of interest and concern. In my judgment, the primary responsibility for absence of action rests with the Congress of the United States. Mayor Lindsay uh, laid the blame on the Congress of the United States for any inaction. I think that's right. I'd agree with him. No money? Is that what the problem is? They, well, no not, action. After no action. The money for the... Well, there's been no action. There's really been no discussion about it uh, in, the, in the committees in the Senate. It's just lied fallow. No movement at all. Pro or con. As Congress reconvened yesterday after its traditional long Easter recess, there was still no sign of movement by the federal government on the problems of the cities. The president has so far received the findings of his commission with restrained enthusiasm. It was, he said, prepared by good and serious men. It was, he said, thorough. It contained many good recommendations, he said, like those his administration had earlier proposed. Congress, worried about balancing a budget and now apprehensive about rewarding riot, has shown still fewer signs of providing what the commission asked, a commitment to national action. But have the April riots and the Easter pause to reflect caused any new prospects of action by the White House and Congress? Dan Rather and Roger Mudd report. It no longer seems possible to report on the mood of the Congress. For in the last six months, the Senate has drawn so far apart from the House on Civil Rights that there are two distinct moods. The House, it seems, remains the alley scrapper. It's dukes up in the air, convinced it is defending the neighborhood, daring the Negro marchers to cross the line. But the Senate appears genuinely to be changing. Just last week, the Senate's Southern Conservative establishment was unceremoniously dumped on three separate votes 
involving summer jobs, Head Start, and school lunch programs, and the quantities of money being sucked out of the city and into the military. And just this afternoon, the Senate's old windsock of change, Everett Dirksen, told reporters that neither a disruptive march on Washington nor a summer of violence would alter his view that what is needed is an expanded job training program, tax credits to industry for providing the jobs, and a rebuilding of the ghettos engineered by someone like William Levitt of Levittown. This is not to say that the Senate or the House under pressure will now spring into action on the riot report. Everyone on the Hill is acutely aware of the financial box the administration is in. But when politicians from Dirksen on down start declaring that the fear of backlash is nothing compared to the fear of a paralyzed nation, we do say that a change is visible and sizable. The president would like to increase the velocity of those congressional winds of change. He claims he is doing all possible behind the scenes to make them blow harder. But he views it as a slow process and one that cannot be helped by any fire and brimstone speeches nor dramatic public gestures on his part. We could engage in rhetoric, hyperbole, and demagoguery over this Turner report, but we aren't, says one high-ranking White House aide who adds, and I quote, we don't want expectations to exceed possibilities. This president practices the art of the possible, and implementing all of the Kerner report immediately simply is not possible. Because we don't have the money, yes. But more importantly, because neither the Congress nor the people yet have the will. That is a step-by-step -step educational process. This high-ranking presidential aide goes on to say, pass first the model cities, rent supplement and housing bills already in the hopper. Then we can move on to additional needed programs. End of quotation. In short, the president has handled the riot commission report like the political nitroglycerin it is, cautiously, warily. He is not about to start taking chances with it now. Dan Rather, CBS News, the White House. Watch this widely used spray cleaner on greasy dirt. Works pretty good, but see how fast it runs? That can cause streaking and extra work. That's why Ajax came up with a brand new idea for a spray cleaner, specially made to help protect against streaking. Ajax concentrates its power where the dirt is. Wipe, and it comes clean. So get Ajax spray cleaner, specially formulated to help protect against streaking. For cellar to attic house cleaning, here's what we use. Handy wipes, tough, all-purpose claws, soft as chamois. They wipe, dust, polish, work a thousand ways. Marvelous for cleaning sooty dirt. Handy wipes rinse out cleaner, won't smear that dirt around. Our windows prove that. Great for polishing, and they last and last. Less than a nickel each and machine washable. Nicest thing that's ever happened to house cleaning, handy wipes. The main emphasis of the President's Commission was on cure for the causes of riot. But the Commissioners also dealt with ways of containing riots once they break out. Federal action on prevention has been minimal so far, as we have noted. But the government has had to act to minimize the effect of the new rash of riots. More U.S. Army troops and National Guardsmen, 68,000, were called up this month to deal with domestic disorder than at any time since the Civil War. Some Guardsmen, and some police departments sought again to repress the rioters with brutality. But many more this time did seek to follow the policy of restraint, which the riot report urged, and which the Justice Department had been teaching police officials all winter long. Attorney General Ramsey Clark assessed the results. Riots or wild violence that could have easily led to a major riot occurred in more than a hundred cities, but the police have acted with balance generally. And because of that, there were fewer deaths, fewer deaths and less property damage than in one riot last year. And we can bless our police for that. In Washington, 9,000 troops were called in to control 48 hours of looting and arson. But fewer than 15 rounds were fired by those troops. Seven Negroes died but only one was shot by a law enforcement officer. In Chicago, the police and National Guard also used the Justice Department guidelines of restraint, at least in theory. It was still a bloody, costly three days for Chicago. Eleven persons, all Negro, died. Two of those were killed by police who caught them looting. But for Chicago's angry Mayor Richard Daley, 
this was still too much restraint. I was disappointed to know that every policeman out on the beat was supposed to use his own decision. And this decision evidently was his. In my opinion, he should have had instructions to shoot arsonists and to shoot looters. Shoot arsonists to kill and shoot looters in order that they be detained. And in my opinion also, there should have been mace used on these looters when this was being conducted. New York Mayor John Lindsay expressed strong disagreement with Daly. In times of trouble, we're going to respect human life fully as much as our obligation to maintain public order. Uh, we are not going to turn disorder into chaos uh, through the unprincipled use of armed force. In short, we are not going to shoot children in New York City. No children, no adults were shot in New York streets. Several thousand looters sacked Harlem streets for nearly seven hours, the worst outbreak of looting in that area's history. But in what may be the most militant ghetto in the nation, there were no snipers. No soldiers were needed in New York. It seemed to me that it, at a high policy level, a decision was made to trade appliances for human lives. And to me, this worked. I think that the behavior of the police, the discipline, and it, interesting enough, I thought I sensed more than discipline. I thought I sensed in the police behavior in Harlem humanity. What Dr. Clark calls a decision to trade appliances for human lives has caused more controversy than any other aspect of the April riots. Anguished moderates have asked whether looters rewarded, or at least unpunished, may not ultimately bring American society to chaos. A new white backlash is plainly visible in the country. The lead story in today's Wall Street Journal is headed, Ghetto Violence Brings Hardening of Attitudes Toward Negro Gains. Still, backlash has not dissipated the impact of the riot report among hundreds of thousands of people in America's urban communities. The report turned out to be a runaway bestseller. 740,000 copies were sold the first three weeks. More than a million are now in print. Bantam Books, which published the first edition, calls it the fastest selling paperback since Valley of the Dolls, which it does not precisely resemble in style. For what one blue collar community in Brooklyn has done, here is David Colvin. This is Bushwick, a neighborhood in Brooklyn that's half black and half white. There is racial tension here, and this could become the scene of a summer riot. But they've been lucky so far in having no trouble. One reason for this good fortune is that a minority here is working for racial harmony. One of the things that they've been doing is selling copies of the president's report on civil disorders. At PS 151, where the pupils are mostly Negro or Puerto Rican, the school's book fair was enlarged to include a table full of the paper-bound reports. Sixth graders were not the best customers. But throughout the neighborhood, in various ways, more than 2,000 copies of the riot report were sold in less than a week. And 8,000 more copies were quickly ordered. A few blocks away, drums and bugles joined the sales pitch at 14 Holy Martyrs Roman Catholic Church. Several young priests in Bushwick are active behind the scenes, urging sales of the report as a first step by whites toward recognizing what the priests and the report see as the fundamental problem, white racism. One of these priests is Father Roger Martin. What's your target there? I, I think that there's probably a general mm. assumption that, that church-going people are most likely to understand a problem like this. Is that true or not? I wish it were. Um, the problem, the charge of racism, is a charge which infects the culture of our country. And um, the sickness of racism is, uh, well, religion doesn't give you an immunity to it. 
Yesterday, a group of Father Martin's colleagues sent a petition to the National Conference of Catholic Bishops meeting in St. Louis, asking that the church buy a million copies of the report for distribution. And this weekend, 2,000 citizens of Ithaca, New York, population 28,000, signed a petition supporting higher federal income taxes to implement the provisions of the riot report. And most important in the absence of government action are the widespread efforts by the business community throughout the U.S. to invest in jobs and hope in the ghettos beyond anything ever tried before in American history. This is about the headache tablets you and your family take. Watch. Two leading extra strength tablets. While this one contains several useful pain relievers, just two anison give you more of the specific pain reliever doctors recommend most than four of the other extra strength tablets. Surprised? Okay, I'll do it again. Two anison give you more of the pain reliever doctors recommend most than four of the other extra strength tablets. Of course, four of these would be more than you should take but it would take at least four of the other extra strength tablets to give you as much of this pain reliever as in two anison. Now that you know this, I hope the next time you need a headache tablet, you reach for help, reach for anison, and relax. The transformation of a society, which is what the riot report is really all about, requires the full commitment of a nation's leaders. But in our system, political leaders seldom commit themselves to radical action without the urging or at least the support of those who are led. That commitment has not been made so far. Without the active participation of the entire community, our society is likely to remain, as the report found it, divided and racist. Roger Martin, a parish priest, and Kenneth Clark, a social scientist, are convinced of this. Yeah, I have now come to the conclusion that what American society is caught up and it's a rather pervasive affliction, you know, a pervasive disease in which the actions of the White House, whoever is there, and congressmen are barely reflecting the level of maturity or immaturity of the larger society. If you would ask me where I would look now to try to find the basic solutions to America's problems, I would look in white communities. If the white community hears the charge of racism and does nothing, refuses to acknowledge the charge, then what happens in the future, I'm afraid of. Kenneth Clark was one of the first witnesses before the riot commission. Commissioners described him as the best. In his t testimony, he spoke of other earlier reports that produced the same analysis, the same recommendations, the same inaction. Such reports to Dr. Clark and to men of the ghetto like Newark's Charlie Dallab are part of the white establishment's game. But Charlie Dallab noted that if reports are not acted upon, he's got to show you that he's hungry. This is Harry Reasoner. Good night. This has been a CBS News special. What happened to the riot report?